Good morning, everybody. Is, does everybody still have their energy, or were you out until about 4 a.m. last night? <laughs> I see a lot of smiling people with uh, bags under their eyes, so we're doing something right. So um, I know you know these fine folks already since you've been in the audience uh, uh, for the last uh, good part of an hour. So I want to thank you guys and, for being here. And just to throw something out to all you guys, uh, just to start, we're here to really learn about uh, why uh, you guys have grown the way that you've grown over the last few years. And is there a certain particular thing that you could tell yourself and, or advice that you would give yourself uh, looking back uh, you know, from, from this point in time? What have you learned that you wish you could tell the younger you, uh, you know, to be mindful of as you're growing? So I would say the one thing I would tell the younger version of myself is um, taking a, a complex technology problem uh, and coming up with a solution um, is, is incredibly challenging, but actually it's the messaging and the storytelling around what that solution is um, that really makes the product stick or the opportunity stick. Love that. I, I mean, I jump in there and I think for me, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And so that principle, I think early on, there was a notion where whatever it took to grow was the advice being pumped into me um, by investors and by other founders. And I think that notion of doing it right, doing it your way, um, is, is what I would really drill home. I would say, like, measure everything, seriously. <laughs> We have, what, maybe 40 weeks, really, that you can actually affect if you're in software to build in a year, maybe. And that means you have 40 chances to validate your ideas if you do, like, weekly sprints. If you're doing every two sprints, you know, every two weeks, you've got 20 chances to validate your ideas. Measure it and just test, experiment, rinse and repeat. Uh, the other thing is, like, and we were talking about this early, um, there's like this notion or this mentality of just move fast and break stuff. But the problem is that oftentimes people misinterpret that and they don't actually go back and fix it. Like, you have to have a solid product that actually does what it says it's going to do. No one has patience to wait around for it. So keep optimizing, because that's the job. Like, that's what we're doing in growth, is constantly optimizing the core workflows. Um, I would definitely say, you know, as cliche as it may sound, like hire the right people. I think we've all done those sort of wrong hires that you almost feel in your stomach when you do it, but then it proves over time. And that's not just costly economically, but also like energy-wise. Uh, you spend a lot of time on the people closest to you. So I think it's really, really important that it feels as close to 100% as possible. You know, so that's actually a really interesting point, and I know we were talking about that previously. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many people here love the people that they work with? Like, love them. Okay, great. So, much better chance. No, for the most part, I do. Um, I think one of the key things that we've noticed is that the companies that succeed, they don't just have a great, uh, you know, product or vision in mind, but they also have great people to achieve that vision alongside, you know? So what have you guys learned about picking the right teams, about, uh, you know, it, how much of a delta in growth do you achieve when you've got the right people versus the wrong people? Uh, from, from my end, I think it's everything. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is it's, as you scale, not everyone scales with you, and that's all right. Um, and I think as you focus on how well you work together, being very clear what's expected of someone, uh, the value that they're bringing, um, and helping them understand what's best for their career um, can make some of those difficult decisions where they were great for a certain stage, but maybe in the next stage of the company they don't have the skill set needed, either helping them of how to grow in that area or how to move on and find kind of the next opportunity because they themselves just love and should always be in that zero to one state of getting something off the ground and never in taking something from one to scale. And I think, you know, as you hire and grow the company, you're really building a family and having a very shared vision is critical. Um, certainly with our company, we're very distributed. So having that articulated shared vision across the company 
with a number of different locations is really critical for our success and for people to be able to be heads down and work independently. I guess the one thing I've learned, at least we're talking about team building, is oftentimes like we reflect a lot on things that aren't working maybe, like the failures. I find that it's most difficult to champion the success and that it's very important to ba like actually bake in to a team, like why did we do well? And reflect and be happy about it and just draw people together, especially if you're distributed. There needs to be a common spirit of delivery, right? And if that is missing in a team, I think it can stunt growth. I would, I would definitely champion uh, attitude because with the right attitude towards like being in a startup and the journey ahead, I think you can learn anything. You can hire someone with zero experience as long as they have the right attitude uh, towards the whole sort of journey ahead of them. But, but I don't think you can hire someone with great skill but poor attitude. Um, I, we have a question that, that's one of my favorite questions in our mm -hmm. recruiting process, which is like, tell me about a time when you worked really hard to achieve a goal. And you wouldn't believe the, the range of answers you get to that question. You can get everything from like, yeah, I spent you know, two years building my own startup to like, you know, once I had to stay over, I stayed like 30 minutes every day for four days in a row, 30 minutes past my sort of quitting time. And you realize that like they're applying to the same job and it's really a way of looking at hard work. Yeah. Uh, and as you know, like, Building a startup is hard work for a very, very long time. So getting someone in who thinks hard work is 30 minute overtime four days in a row, that's like they won't be happy at your company, probably. Well, yeah, that actually, it, it's funny because one thing that I think that a lot of you guys are talking about uh, is really, you have to, obviously you need the right people, but you also need to be very quick, quick to market, quick to iterate. And how do you balance those two, uh, I feel like sometimes competing uh, desires where you want to be really quick, but you also want to take the time to analyze and iterate and constantly refine your vision. How do you balance those two? Mm. I, so, I don't know if, question. oh, sorry. <laughs> Go. Go ahead. I mean, I don't know of an environment, and I think there's a few cases where first to market is necessary, yeah. um, but more often than not, it's, it's not. I mean, I think we think about the company that maybe was, we thought was the first, but the reality was, you know, there was a few years of innovation ahead of them. And it goes back to the doing it right. Um, I think of anything like this is beyond a marathon. I send people home. I get upset if anyone's in the office past five o'clock because they need to be enjoying their family, their friends and life because it creates a healthier work environment. And in the long term, their tenure at Visco is going to be that much more productive. So there are moments where everyone has to be like, we got to get this out and this is like, and it's a short period of time, but not sustained in the normal work behavior. So, yeah. Five o'clock, oh my God, okay. Oh, we, I it's a, I, we do not provide dinner. Um, there is, everything is to get out of the office and to, you know, take care of your, back to yourself. I have to take care of myself before I can take care of my family. I have to take care of my family before I can take care of Visco. Um, and everyone has their personal and relations that need to be met. Otherwise, that is what is going to help force them to be unproductive. It's usually those, the lack of taking care of themselves or their family or friends or loved ones that results in an unproductive work environment. So. I, mean, I, would, I would agree, actually, because I mean, I've, I'm not building with my team the first OKR management software. Like, I'm not. I know I have competitors in the space, yeah. and I need to be able to get into the market, but there's no first mover in advantage for me. They're already out there, and they're moving. So I have to be sensitive to those things, too. But I also have to be responsible toward the vision that our company has, and that's the purpose that I was talking about. You had an idea of what was supposed to happen, and you need to constantly be focused on actually getting the team to get closer and closer to that thing over time and to embrace the ability for people to take breaks, because there's no way that we can sustain an amazing amount of productivity over a really long stretch of time. You're gonna get dipped sometimes in delivery, and it needs to be okay, because people need to take a breath. And I think if we respond to our work humanly, then over the long term, we're going to hopefully you know, produce good results. See, that's interesting, because I think that what you uh, are, both are saying is, 
probably counterintuitive to some people here, and yet I think it actually makes a lot of sense. So let me actually turn it over to you. Uh, um, yeah. What, yeah. So I was going to mention one thing in terms of rapid iteration and, and testing. I think there are unsung heroes, um, which are beta testers, um, who actually don't technically work on your payroll. And we have leveraged our beta testers. They are part of our community. They're part of our product. They're part of what makes us great. Being able to build product and get it out to beta testers and get their feedback, their rabid, passionate feedback has been so helpful to us. And I think that building an effective beta program is like part of the process. But if you really embrace that community, it's amazing how far you can go. And those guys, they, they're, they're working for you when they're not working because it's fun. And by the way, and I think that that's an important point, for uh, beta testing and getting feedback from the crowd that you're trying to serve, you don't actually need to have like a software product. Like that, that's true for even if you have a consumer product that you're trying to launch, something tangible, getting it out into people's hands. So I wanted to ask uh, all of you guys, something actually, like is there anything counterintuitive that has helped you grow that most people don't necessarily feel uh, the same way about? Like anything that you learned where you're like, huh, I wouldn't have thought that to be true, but that is true. Um, one and very early on, it was counterintuitive even to what I thought. It was, we were looking for culture fits. Who fits the culture of Visco as we're hiring? Um, and it was Katie, our head of people, was like, I never want to hear that again. We're looking for culture ads, people that bring something new that changes it because we're always trying to keep our culture the same as, it, as we scaled but it's like a healthy culture evolves over time. And it evolves based upon the great people that you bring in that are able to bring who they are and their experiences. And so we shifted entirely from this culture fit to culture ad, and we have a specific portion of the interview process that's really to seek that out of what is this person bringing that doesn't exist to Visco already? What's a different viewpoint, a different experience, um, in which, you know, Go figures resulted in a massively more diverse workforce at Visco, which has been absolutely great and has been directly tied to our success. Yeah, and um, I, I completely agree to that. And, and it's, um, I think as one thing for me is that as a founder, it's, it's less about being operational. A lot of founders seems to like want to stay operational, are very uncomfortable moving out of the operational zone. And I think that your job as a founder is to absolutely set the sort of operations framework, but then to back out and be not a sort of culture keeper, but a culture bearer at least, and work towards building your team. Like that is literally the only thing you need to do well as a founder to sort of scale as a business. You don't have to be the expert in operations. You don't have to be like, if, if you are, you're probably hiring people that are worse than you, and you're trying to sort of keep ownership of, of something that you shouldn't hold on to. So I believe very strongly that you should, as early as possible, give away ownership to other teams, other people, because that helps the whole culture add um, to culture uh, in the company so that you can actually grow as a team. I, I'm more of a product person, obviously. <laughs> um, so I would say, I mean, if you're building something and the counterintuitive thing to me is keep the customers you have happy. Like, retention is the largest contributor to growth. This is actually mathematically proven. And I mean, I've read countless articles, but even in my practical experience, it always is shocking that we sink a lot of money on the top of the funnel, and we don't necessarily carry them on the journey. There's like this gap between this is what you were sold and marketed, and this is the product. And there's like massive gap in the middle of the promise versus what you, you propose you're going to do. Why, why do you guys all think that? Because uh, I, I find that to be so true. And like you said, it's kind of been mathematically proven. And yet virtually every company that I've ever advised uh, gets it wrong to some extent, where you spend most of your time on, I need to get more people. And you kind of take the people that you have for granted. Not saying you guys have done that, but why do you think that that is, where it's so sexy to focus on acquisition, and it's kind of like lame to focus on retention, when that's your customer, that's the person you should be most passionate about you know, serving, the people that you have. Why do you think people get that wrong? I mean, I think primarily people get that wrong because we're all looking for the hockey stick growth. And there's a certain period that you need to be focused on that flat part, right? Um, and so, but we're looking for the next thing. 
I mean, I think, you know, most people are focused on building a great business and not focused on the relationship to the consumer. And so, you know, people talk about being engineering-led or being product-led, growth-led. Um, I think that the, we, we talk about being consumer-led um, and building for the needs of the consumer. Um, so I do think it's a, it's a mind shift, um, but it's an, it's an important one for sure. Yeah. Well, um, I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, so there might be somebody coming around uh, with a mic. Uh, if uh, Thanks a lot. Um, if anybody has anything for us. Uh, if not, I've got one or two more for, for the crew. Uh, yeah, so oh, one over there. Great. Hi, my name is Lisa. So um, how can I keep customer retri retention through um, like um, satisfying the uh, relationship in terms of contact, should I always have uh, uh, different channels to get uh, the clients to reach me? How can I improve the quality of service in terms of uh, relationship with the customer? I mean, I think the key, yes. I think. It, the management needs to be a really smooth workflow, right? You have a sales team, you have customer success team, you've got a product team. Uh, since we're super small, I can tell you, I'm on calls with our customers. I'm the chief product officer, and it's not, I'm, this is not, you know, I'm not too big for that, right? I have touch points. And actually, like something that I've experienced too that's great is putting everyone, engineering, product, sales, it doesn't matter, through the customer success like calls and actually triaging with the team because then you have this empathy that you build into your company of this is what the customers are actually struggling with. And hey, you're an Android developer and you could fix that. And they actually read the ticket and they're like, I could do it now. And it's mm. super exciting because they close the loop of what they're doing and actually providing that purpose for that work. And so, I, I mean, I highly recommend everyone in every company, it doesn't matter who you are on staff, to take a tour with your customer success team or, you know, like do the sales calls and reach out to your customers and really get to know who they are because it matters. They're like, wow, you're the CPO and you're talking to me. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. because I want to know what matters to you so I can build the product better for people like you. And I think that's important. Yeah. I think one thing to think about, we talk about language creates reality um, at Visco, and so even just how you refer to your consumers in your company and the data that you say, or even the goals that are set for the company, if it's a revenue target and it's just revenue, then your people are just thinking about money, and that is really their like focal point on a, on a goal setting. So everything down to the goals being set about, for us, it's about number of members. Um, with our subscription business. And everything is focused on the member. Everything is about a person. Every day when we walk in, we share the imagery from the communities up on the wall, like rotating, reminding us all why we're there doing what we're doing and who we're building for. Uh, the lunch line kind of for that is like, there's our, our research team has done from like little snippets of uh, community members and their bio and their work and what, it, what, what inspires them just to keep the team grounded on who we're building for. So I think there's just a lot of little things you can do around the office, um, around the goal setting, um, but reminding that language creates reality is a big one. You know, uh, and I think we've got just time for one very quick one. So in a nutshell, how important for you, uh, for you guys is the environment that you work in, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of consistent growth on an ongoing basis? I mean, oh. I think. <laughs> sorry. So I was like, I, was, I think the work environment is like absolutely bar essential. Like, it's got to be a productive place. It's got to be a great place. It's got to be a calming place. It's it's really important, um, both for every employee that walks in and anyone from the community that walks in has to say, this space is Visco. It's the brand manifested into a physical space, and every touch point that they have fits to the mission. I, yeah, sorry. I, uh, I agree. I, it's not a 10 out of 10, because I think you need to sort of go beyond your office walls with uh, mission and vision. But it's in, ex, an extremely important tool, the environment, to sort of 
spread the mission and vision, both to sort of new people that's coming in, but also to existing ones to like reinforce it? I think it's important to, I mean, our team is like really spread out over the world. And so to have like an environment where it's like calm and peaceful, like we can work from home if we want. So it's not about that for us. It's really about making sure we're connected with what's happening with the rest of the organization and doing it together. Um, so I guess if that's kind of the undertone for, for business, then it's good, right? Because you know who's who and what everyone's doing and, it, and you can be confidently delivering together. Amen to that. Thank you guys so much. This is really helpful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.